This conference will now be recorded. Hi, everybody. Um, I figured we'll get things started here, and as people join, we'll get them up to speed quickly. Um, so my name is Mackenzie LeBert. I'm with Mass TLC. Thank you for spending your final few hours of work week here with us. Um, we have an exciting afternoon planned. I know it's a really nice day out, and some people probably wanted to go for a nice walk during their lunch hour. So definitely appreciate you being here. Um, this meeting is being recorded just so people know. Um, so you can reference it after. So this workshop is how to, be, oh my gosh, <laughs> the baby, <laughs> love it. Um, how to build your brand in a remote world. Um, and this comes out of our Tech Runs Boston community, which is a new mass TLC community uh, meant for our young tech professionals to share ideas, best practices, learn from each other and have fun. And, um, you know, I'm sad we couldn't do this in person the first time around, but we're adjusting quickly to this new world. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll see where the rest of the year takes us. Um, thank you to Mass TLC's global sponsors um, who support everything we do throughout the year. Um, they really provide not only financial support, but thought leadership, um, and, and they're great companies um, to get to know uh, in the Boston ecosystem. Um, a few kind of housekeeping notes here. Um, you know, like every webinar, unless you're speaking, please stay muted just to um, keep the background noise down. There is a chat button um, if you want to chat over any questions you might have um, for the group or comments as we're thinking. But if you know it's a small interactive group here, so if you want to just speak out, you can do that too. Just unmute yourself. Um, and like I said, this is being recorded for us to be able to share after. So don't feel like you have to, you know, if there's certain things you're trying to write down quickly or take notes, we will share this after. Um, so we'll get things started quickly. I'm happy to introduce Nikhil Paul, um, culture and team coach of We Are Human to lead this three-part workshop today. Um, he's a lot of fun, so I hope you guys are ready and excited. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Hi, Kate. Hi, Terry. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Robin. Hi, Georgia. Hi, Anne-Marie. Hi, Zachary. Hi, Rita. Hi, mm -hmm. Nayla. Hi, Claire. Hi, Eric. And hi, VP. And of course, thank you, Mackenzie, for having me here. Uh, welcome, everyone, to How to Build Your Brand in a Remote workplace. Uh, how's everyone doing this Friday? Give me a thumbs up if everyone's doing good. Yes? Okay, awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to get started. Uh, so let's see if this works. All right. Okay, everyone can see my screen? I'm guessing. Yes? All right. All right, okay, so let's go ahead and get it started. So first of all, thank you all for having me. Like I said, like Mackenzie said, my name is Nikhil Paul. I'm the founder of We Are Human and I'm a culture and team coach. And welcome again to how to build your brand in a remote world. Uh, before we get started, uh, there is a worksheet you can copy to follow along for the reflections uh, or feel free to write it down yourself on a notepad and pen. But if you scroll up to the first uh, in the chat box, you'll see a link there. Um, make make a copy of that worksheet, otherwise everyone will see what you're writing, <laughs> which is totally fine, uh, but we just want to let everyone else have a chance to write down as well. So feel free to go ahead and copy that. Um, again, if you want, you can use a notepad and pen, so it's not a big deal. And like Mackenzie said, this is recorded, so you can go back and always look at it later as well. Um, and again, we this is a one hour workshop and we're going to be covering a lot of concepts. Uh, the goal of this workshop is to kind of give you a quick preview of all these concepts and to get your engines started, right? Uh, to plant some seeds for you all to nurture in the following weeks. No, um, and uh, and the main thing is it'll, it's 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 meant to be an exercise that'll help reflect what you guys want to think about when you think about your own brand. All right. So let's go ahead. The first thing. Okay. So I like to do a quick breathe uh, breathing exercise just because I know we're all like you know stressed out at times. I know we're all feeling a little bit. So just bear with me, like, let's do a couple of deep breaths to center ourselves before we get started. And of course, no one's watching you. You can do whatever you want. But uh, close your eyes for a quick second and take a deep breath in. And release. Take another deep breath in. And release. Take one more deep breath in. and release. Okay. So before we jump in, I also wanna get us to move a little bit. So I'm gonna quickly 
I also lead a little bit of dance in my spare time. So I, I want everyone to just kind of shake their shoulders a little bit. Cause I know you guys do a lot of workshops and I've been in a bunch of workshops as well. And I find that a lot of times my shoulders and my back is cramped. So I'm going to lead us in some quick stretchable dance workshops. I was going to put the music on, but for now, let's just go ahead and just move and rotate our shoulders for a little bit. Everyone, uh, I can do an acapella, but we'll do that for later. All right. And then we're going to do a turn to the side. We're going to do a little bit of side swing, side swing. Yes. And the best part about this is I want you guys to get loosened up so I can have you more participate more in the group discussions. And then we're going to just kind of punch the sky, punch the sky. Guys, this is amazing. This is a new community we're building for Mass TLC. So I need everyone to be as excited. Pretend you're actually there live in person. All right, now bring it down. Now we just bring it back down. Let's just get it centered right back to the middle. There you go. Perfect. And for those of you who are just on audio, I can only imagine what your spouses are thinking. Um, all right. Awesome. So let's go ahead and get back to it. I will jump back into it. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. All right. So we all know our world has kind of been turned upside down in the past couple of weeks. Uh, and I think most of us are finally accepting that. Right. I think this is going to be life for the next couple of weeks, if not months. And, you know, for a lot of us, we're really stressed out. We're really kind of um, just unsure. What does this mean? How is this going to affect my workplace? How is this going to affect my career? And uh, I would ask you to reframe that question, um, reframe that perspective, right? Because I think a lot of times when we come to workplace, we think that there's only one way in how we can work and how we can be productive and how we can add value. But the truth is, with technology these days, um, there's no lack of uh, effort and communication that we can take to really make sure we have an impact in our workplace and make sure our careers are doing well. So today's agenda is about how to build your brand in the modern remote workplace. And we are going to cover what's in a brand. Uh, we're going to go how to know yourself, how to find your evangelists, the people who really support you, your support network, um, how to build goodwill in a community that's in crisis, right? I think that's another part of what we're going through. And I think it speaks to the specific time we're in. And then finally, how do we use all of this and kind of put together a game plan that'll get us to the top? Whatever the top looks like for you. For some of you, it might be CEO. For some of you, it might be the head of your team. But the idea is how do we put together the truest version of ourselves so that we can add more impact and value to our workplace. And then at the same time, also feel like we're being truly reflective of who we are, okay? so. What is in a brand, right? I think for most of us, when we think about our work, we're like, well, I don't understand this whole idea of brand. Brands are for something companies do, and my work speaks for itself. Um, and that's true. Your work does speak for itself, but it's also just one dimension, right? I think if you think about it, working hard and the quality and impact of your work should necessarily, in a logical world, that should speak for itself completely. But the truth is, there's a th another dimension. And the other dimension is the people who work with you. Um, they have perceptions and judgments about you and your work, right? They, they have opinions about who you are, what you're good at, and possibly even what you're not good at. Um, they perceive you in a certain way. And so in short, they've branded you in their minds, right? So your personal brand um, there are a couple of definitions for this out there, but I like this. This to me resonates the most. Um, your personal brand is a story you consistently tell through your words and actions about <clears throat> your mission, your capabilities, and your expertise. Again, your personal brand is a story you consistently tell through your words and your actions about your mission, your capabilities, and your expertise. Now, that's a lot. I don't expect you guys to remember that one. And so a better way to kind of put that together, as I think is using an example, um, for those of you who are fans of history like I am, uh, you'll know, know that a lot of knights back in the Middle Ages have coat of arms. You've probably heard of this. And a coat of arms is how a knight is recognized, especially in the battlefield. And so that's the way to think about your personal brand. Your personal brand is your coat of arms. It's how you get recognized and remembered. Okay. Um, does that make sense? If anybody has any questions at any point, feel free to put it on the chat box or, you know, uh, unmute yourself and ask, and I'd be happy to. So that's the idea about the personal brand. It's your coat of arms and how we get recognized and how do we use that for our own leverage. <clears throat> Next. 
for your brand to grow, there are specific things you need to do. First, you need to be authentic. Second, you need to be intentional. And third, you need to be consistent. Okay, these are the three facets of how to build your personal brand. Let me get into it. For those of you, I think everybody loves Tom Hanks. I don't know if anyone who doesn't love Tom Hanks. Um, and there's a reason. He, for me, really resonates with this part of personal branding, authenticity, right? Um, for you to have a good brand, you have to be authentic. It has to speak to who you are and your personality. Um, and your personality is like a quirky, playful, curious you when your guard is down. And that's Tom Hanks, like literally all the time. Um, it highlights what you're really good at and excites you um, and what brings you joy. Um, but it also shows up at times when you're feeling like you're under pressure um, or when things are not going well. And the best way to recognize authenticity is to showcase pure moments of joy and frustration. Uh, case and example is Tom Hanks at the Golden Globes. I don't know if you guys saw this. It's been going around a bit. Um, I think Ricky Gervais was making a bunch of off-color jokes and uh, Tom Hanks was not feeling it. And so like, well, everybody else in the audience is laughing and clapping along because nobody wants to feel like they're that person. Um, Tom Hanks has no problem being himself. I'm like, yikes, I don't know about that. I don't know if I like that joke. Uh, and to me, that's so Tom Hanks. That's just like authenticity, right? So, okay, first part, authenticity. Next, intentionality. When I think of intentionality, I think of Oprah. Uh, Oprah is just everything, right? And so many things, Oprah is really the best, but she's also very intentional. That's one thing, if you think about what she does, she knows her mission, right? At the core of intentionality is knowing your mission and purpose, because that guides all your actions. Um, it's also the lens with which you view all your interactions, uh, your resources and situations. So having a sense of intentionality is kind of a filter through which to view the world. Um, and the last part about intentionality is that it helps you become absolutely focused. Um, the best brands are the ones that are focused and get comfortable learning to say no. Uh, I think that's a tough thing for a lot of us, mm, and me especially, I'm a people pleaser. And when people want me to come in and do things, I'm definitely all for it. But I think learning to say no is a skill set that you don't realize, but it's actually, uh, it's actually strengthening and bolstering your brand. And again, case and example, uh, for Oprah, I saw this interview where Oprah was doing at Stanford, and it's a very hoity-toity event where she was the guest of honor, and people were so enamored with her. And you know, these are some of the smartest people in the world. And the host just asks her, um, what is your thoughts on sustainability and development? Like, how do you think the world should be uh, thinking about sustainability and ecological development? And again, that question is cool. I feel like a lot of people might get something like that, especially people of influence. Um, but this interview was more about Oprah's life and how she became successful. And this was like the last part of the interview. And she literally thought about it for a good couple of seconds and then said, you know what, I don't think I can speak to that. I really don't know enough to speak to that. And I was just kind of a little bit flabbergasted because she's Oprah. She always has something to say about everything. And to me, that speaks to, she sticks to her wheelhouse. What does she know? What is she really good at? And I think that's what we all have to be comfortable. We have to learn to say no and be really good at what we're really good at and be comfortable saying, staying in that wheelhouse, right? <clears throat> So the next part of finding your brand is you got to have consistency, right? Consistency, when I think about consistency, I think we all know this person. He's been in the news a lot, Bernie Sanders, right? I think if you can say one thing about Bernie Sanders, you can definitely say he's been consistent. And consistency stems from knowing your values and your roots, right? So for all of us who are trying to kind of build our brand, it's all about the micro act. We have to be aware and focus on our micro behaviors, our day-to-day -day actions, and the habits that reinforce who we are and what we stand for. Uh, and Bernie Sanders is emblematic of this. I think if you ever want to look for someone who's consistent in his brand, it's Bernie Sanders, right? Um, and being consistent is not just about the small day-to-day -day stuff. It's also about having a larger purpose and a larger game plan um, that's clear, that's cohesive, and it's motivational for everyone to see. So you got to create a game plan and work towards that every day um, and over a period of time. That's how you build the fact that you have consistent in your brand. 
So uh, again, with Bernie Sanders as well, you can tell, right? Like take a look at this worksheet. Like this is something people post, I think in his campaign a lot. It's like the same messaging from the beginning towards the end, he's still the same person. Um, and again, that speaks to his idea of being consistent. <clears throat> okay, so the second part is about knowing yourself. So before we can advocate for ourselves, we have to first know ourselves, all right? And the more you know your core fundamentals, the more you can recognize opportunities that resonate with it. And that's why it's really important to really double down on understanding what motivates us, what undergirds our incentives and really kind of pushes us to look at certain opportunities and turn down other things or find things that are easy to find ourselves being gravitated towards. We got to better understand ourselves so that we can better situate ourselves for the best opportunities. And then once you see those opportunities, you're going to have to be ready with your pitch, right? You have to be articulate and compelling about who you are, what you're good at, and what you can offer. Um, and that's part of building your personal brand. So we're going to do a quick exercise on that. And so let me quick check in. Is everyone okay? Does anyone have any thoughts or questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and talk or we can keep going. Okay. So, and we'll, we'll have a part for all of us to talk more in a second, okay? <clears throat> all right, knowing yourself. Um, there's, a lot, there's a bunch of research on, you know, and you see a lot of people doing the self-help and kind of breaking down your personality test, your skills test. Um, so the way I like to think about it is that there's three separate categories for knowing yourself. The first of which is motivation. Um, you have to know what motivates you, what inspires you, what gets you out of the bed every day, excited to do what you're going to do. Second, you have to know what you're really good at, right? And that comes down to your skill set. Uh, that could be soft skills or hard skills. And last, it's about flow. Uh, flow is that psychological state when you're in the zone and you're feeling like it. Uh, and I think those three components really help, uh, is one frame of perspective to help you understand who you are and what motivates you. <clears throat> okay, so if you have that worksheet in front of you, go ahead and open it up. Um, if you have a notepad and a pen, go ahead and open that up, get that ready. So let's just go through this, right? So motivation, you can break it down into three fundamental things, all right? Goals, what are your goals? It's pretty simple, everyone knows about this. What do you want? Um, I want you to take 30 seconds and think about what it is that you really want and write it down. Again, you don't have to share this with anyone if you don't feel comfortable, but think about it um, and write it down. What do you want? So I'll give you 30 seconds, yeah? Okay. All right. Hopefully you wrote down a couple of things about what, what do you want in your workplace? Like, what do you want? What are you thinking about? What, and you can be as specific or as generic as you want. Okay. Second is what is your mission? So mission is again, what gets you excited to work on? Um, think about what would make you really excited to work on. Take another 20, 30 seconds write down what would you get really excited to work on. Be as specific or be as generic as you want. The idea is that I wanna help kind of encourage and spur some of this thinking and these reflections. And the last one, that we want to kind of look into is where do you want to be in a couple of years, right? Where do you want to be? What's your vision? Where do you want to be in two years? Where do you want to be in five years? Uh, do you want to be the manager of your group? Do you want to be the CEO of your company? Do you want to be a VP somewhere? Uh, or maybe it's not so, um, uh, you know, 
it's not so transactional. Maybe it's something more impactful, right? Maybe it's like, where do you, uh, maybe you want to have an impact. Maybe you want a bunch of people really looking up to you in your company, or do you want to be someone of significance? What's your vision for yourself? Um, take a couple of seconds and think about that as well. Okay. All right. So now I kind of want to open it up to people. I want to hear um, from everyone kind of what kind of motivates you. Um, I'll take one person. Just give me a quick shout out of what is it that's motivating you to come to the workplace or what, what do you think about it? And if you don't have a full clear answer, that's totally fine. But does anybody want to volunteer and just talk for a couple of seconds about what motivates them? I'm happy to share if nobody else wants to. <laughs> Thanks, Vicente. Go. Yeah, sure. So um, for me, uh, MassGLC is really unique in that we're like a platform that represents a lot of people. So Tech Runs Boston was kind of an idea for me um, to be able to kind of leverage my personal interests and in, in being a part of a next generation um, to be able to really make an impact so I can bring my ideas to the workplace and be able to leverage the organization in a way that kind of combines personal passion, I guess, with um, opportunity. Um, so to be able to, to look, you know, ac across our generation and say, we have so much voice, we have so much impact, what can we do? So that's motivating me. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And you yeah. can really tell from her perspective, it's, um, if I can just kind of analyze that for a quick second, that's like the more of a vision mission statement, right? Like for her, it's the impact she wants to do outwardly to the community, as opposed to kind of more about like, oh, I want the promotion, I want this. And again, it might be that as well, but it's just being clear with yourself about what it is your motivations are, right? There's nothing wrong with whatever you want. Bigger paycheck, bigger house, whatever that is, I think we have to be honest about it. But yes, thank you for sharing that. So I'm gonna continue. Um, okay. All right, next up is skills, all right? Uh, like Mia Mason says, gotta have a particular set of skills for that phone call that's important, all right? All right, so skills can be broken down to three ones, right? You got the functional technical skills, you got the interpersonal uh, skills, and then you also got the problem solving skills. And again, the reason we wanna kind of be mindful about what we're good at is then we can offer and lend ourselves to situations that require these types of skills. Obviously, a great leader has skill sets in all three of these really well honed and developed, but it's also knowing what we naturally gravitate towards. So, when it comes to functional and technical skills, these are the kind of skills that we think about um, that uh, are lend itself to like knowing certain technological things or specific niche subject matter expertise things, right? So you might be the person who's the best at um, manipulating Asana in your workplace, um, the software, or you might be someone who's really good at analyzing industry reports um, and um, really at analyzing industry reports and like, uh, breaking it down and kind of creating uh, a summary for it, right? So think about what are your skill sets? What are three technical or functional skills um, that you have that you're really good at? Um, you can be as specific as you want. In fact, the devil is in the details. If you can come up with uh, something you're really good at, now would be the time. Like maybe you're really good at writing up marketing documents, uh, whatever it is. Take 30 seconds and think about that. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Next one is interpersonal skills, right? And interpersonal, you guys know what this means, but it basically is concerning with social and emotional intelligence skills, right? Um, how do you deal with people? Um, emotions are kind of, if, 
if you were to look at human beings, emotions are a bigger motivator than logic is a lot of times. And so obviously this is a necessary skill that you need when you're interacting with people. So here's the question for you. First one, are you better at one, one-on-one, -on -one, or are you better at leading a group? I find this to be a very helpful question to ask yourself um, because this, again, you now will gravitate towards opportunities that reflect this more. Um, that's the first question. So take, you can do this pretty easily while I'm talking actually, one-on-one -on -one or leading a group. Okay, cool. Next one, are you better through text and email, phone or in person, right? Um, I get stressed out like crazy with text. I cannot text, a bunch of my friends text a lot. I have to do either in person or phone. And that just speaks to what I'm more comfortable doing. So if I'm organizing something, I want to talk to people on a video chat or in person. I just now know that's who I am. I get stressed out if I have to organize through text or email. Okay. Um, no worries, Robin, thank you. All right, so next one, problem solving, okay? So problem solving, again, how well it lends itself to any decisions you have to make, uh, specific problems you have to solve, crises you have to manage, it's a skill set. And again, one of the things you want to think about is your style when it comes to problem solving. Um, are you more decisive or contemplative? Um, do you, when I say decisive or contemplative, think about it for a second and think of, a, are you more instinctual? Uh, or are you like, let me, you know, ruminate on this. Let me munch on this for a bit and get back to you guys, right? <clears throat> So that's something you should think about. What kind of problems do you like? Do you like, are you people, process, or product? Okay, this is a good question to ask yourself. Um, I obviously, I, I enjoy, the reason I'm doing this career uh, is because I enjoy working with people, right? I love looking at process, I look at products as well. I was a product manager in my previous life, but people uh, is what really gets me excited. So take a second and think about what kind of problems do you like? Do you like problems around people, managing people, fixing processes, or product problems? Okay, and let's open it up. What are you good at? So I wanna hear from you guys, um, what are things Tell me one thing you're really good at. Just kind of shout it out, right? Like, what is one thing you're really good at? And it could be something obscure or something specific or something general. Who wants to mention it? I know I'm putting you guys on the spot. So somebody has to brag for 10 seconds. I'm good at mentoring. Nice. Nice. Thanks, Eric. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I'm good, good at learning. Um, Go ahead, Kate. Oh, it wasn't me, actually. I'll go, I'll go for you then. Yes. Go, Zachary. Uh, I'm going to learn um, new pro uh, new platforms and then find like, the pros and cons of them. Oh, that's so so necessary. Good one. Yeah, I love that. Anyone else? Um, I work for Mass TLC with Mackenzie and Kate, and um, we're driven by our members, and I'm really good at databases. Yes. Nice. Mm -hmm. All right. Another very needed skill. Cool. Awesome. So let's go back into it. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you sharing. It really makes it more real when you guys are sharing. Um, all right. <clears throat> okay. So the last one is flow. Uh, you guys know this concept. You probably heard it. Uh, it's in positive psychology. Flow state is also known as being in the zone. It's the mental state in which a person is performing an activity that's fully immersed in a feeling of energized focus, full involvement, and enjoyment in the process of activity. I read that definition out, I'm not that smart. But the truth is that is something you guys are inherently, you're familiar with. We all know this, right? Uh, it's a moment when we get caught up with it. So I wanna kind of break this down a little bit because flow is about being aware of the little moments in your day-to-day -day life. So if you could bear with me, take a couple of seconds and think about, write down moments of joy you have had when you're at work, okay? Take a second, take 30 seconds and think about that. When do you have moments of joy? Uh, I'll give you an example. I sometimes get real, it's weird, but I get moments of joy when I'm like doing spreadsheets and I have to put together a bunch of equations and calculations and just kind of, I nerd out on it for a little bit. I'll just listen to music and nerd out. So I don't know, it's weird. It's just something I really enjoy doing. So take 30 seconds and think about what are moments of joy you have when you're at work. It could be a couple of seconds, an hour, half a day, whatever it is.
And if you can think of why that is, write that down as well. Why do you enjoy that? Maybe you don't have an answer. Sometimes we are mysterious creatures. Okay, next part, write down moments when you're in the zone. And this might be a corollary to the previous question, but it's just a different way to think about it. Um, what were you doing, right? Maybe you were with a bunch of your uh, coworkers and you were coming up with a strategy um, and you just got really into it. Um, or maybe you're putting together a proposal and you just got zoned in. Think about the uh, recent times that you were really in the zone. What were you doing? Cool. All right. So let's move on. And again, uh, the reason I'm giving you a little bit of time and I'm kind of rushing through it a little bit is because of the time constraint, but also to kind of get you started on this process. You can go back and really dig through this and answer the time, take the time to answer it. Okay. And the last one I would say is what are you curious about? I think curiosity is a great way to sniff out what you naturally incline towards. Um, take a couple of seconds and think about what are you curious about? It could be something very niche specific or something more broad in general. Maybe you're curious about how the sausage is made in your factory. Like how exactly does someone push out code if you're working in sales and marketing? Or if you're in the engineering side, like how does a customer register a complaint? Or like, it's really what you're kind of curious about. <laughs> All right, I'm going to move on. Um, again, I, I want. I, I think we're in a bit of a time constraint, so I'm just going to jump on to the next part. Um, but let's finally come down to this. There's a tagline uh, that I think you guys should be able to make from this. And the point of this exercise is I want you to get into creating a tagline. And that's the whole reason we get into finding out, who, knowing who you are and creating your tagline. Because if someone asks you, what would you say you do here? You would be able to respond, oh, I am the bridge between sales, engineering, and customer support, okay? Or I am the team catalyst, okay? Or I am the turnaround architect for struggling projects or teams, okay? So take 30 seconds and come up with your personal tagline. What is a tagline that you have? Again, this doesn't have to be the end all be all, right? We're just coming up with the exercise right now. So this is your first iteration, but if you were to kind of come up with a tagline based on what you know about yourself and what you're interested in and what you're good at, what would that be? And I want to hear one or two taglines. I just think it'd be great for everyone to hear a couple of taglines and try to be specific if possible. Take 30 seconds. Okay, so um, I want to hear from people. Um, does somebody want to share one of their taglines? I would love to hear a tagline that some of you have. Um, anybody want to share? Yeah. Mine's very simple, data queen. Ooh, nice, very nice. Easy, people get it right away. Very cool, thanks Rita. Who else? Okay. All right. Some of us are still munching on our taglines. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Okay. So let's jump back into it, but at least you get the perspective, right? You understand how to come up with something. Think about that as you're thinking about your brand. Okay. All right. So next up, let's go through it. All right. So the third part is once you figure it out and you know who you are, next is to find your evangelists. Evangelists are the people who really are big fans of who you are, right? And the best way to summarize this is, is that Surround yourself with people who see your value and remind you of it. 
that's if I can get you to take away one thing from this section, that's what it is. Find people who see your value and remind you of it. If they check off both those boxes, then you should be thinking about them and bringing them on board as your personal evangelist. Okay. Here's how there's three types of evangelists. First is your rabbi. Okay. For those of you who brought up in the Jewish faith, you know about this idea that a rabbi helps bring in someone who's not of Jewish faith into the Jewish faith. Right. And so I think it's a great metaphor for what we're looking for. And I use that as saying that's akin to finding a mentor, but it's not just finding your mentor. Um, it's kind of finding your sponsor, right? Because a sponsor is a highly placed mentor who can propel you. And that's the distinction I'm trying to make here. When I say find your rabbi, I'm trying to say find somebody who's really well done, well to do for themselves, and they know and they can share a lot, they have life experience, and they can give you insight, but they can also propel your career. So that's something you should be keeping an eye out for. Um, they usually, these are people who reached a level of success and they want to give back. Um, and they're the ones who are going to advise you more on strategy and shifting trends because they have a very different vantage point. They're most likely going to be more at the top and they're going to be looking down and giving you advice on strategy and shifting trends. Um, you got to make sure you're respectful of these people, right? Because you got to be respectful of their time. Most likely these are people who have demanding jobs and a lot of responsibilities. And so when you come and talk to them, uh, be cognizant of their communication style, right? If they're more analytical, come with more data. If they're more of a people person, come with more uh, of a social instinct lean, right? Um, know their communication style and know their goals. Bring something of value to them so they can feel like this is interesting and valuable to them as well. And be purposeful in every interaction, right? Uh, come by saying prepared and figure out, okay, um, you know, this is what I need. This is the problem I'm going through. And I need, I'd love to get your help in thinking through this. It's purposeful. It's direct. It's not wasting their time. Be cognizant of, of that. When you think about the frequency in which you have to meet uh, your mentors slash sponsors, uh, I would say monthly or quarter, quarterly check-ins. Um, again, I think that's a good enough pace to respect their time, but at the same time also being in their foreground, right? Like you're on the top of their mind. They don't forget about you after one coffee. Um, so yeah, first one, respect your rabbi. <clears throat> Quick reflection. I'm gonna actually skip through the reflections because there's a couple more things we need to go through and we're fast on time. But think about who are potential sponsors you really admire, okay? Take one or two uh, seconds and just like go through that. If you can write that down, that'd be great, all right? Uh, I'm gonna move on to the next one. And again, you can always come back to this. I'm going to skip uh, this as well. Um, second one, find your wingman. All right. Uh, finding your wingman is definitely a big part of it. The way I think about it is that they're your best friend at work. Uh, of course, no one's, it's really hard to find a best friend uh, anywhere, especially at work. So don't put that pressure. But the idea is that this is someone, uh, another analogy would be like a startup partner, someone who's really good and complements your skill set. Um, and so if you're more of a, uh, you're better at the larger things, they're better at the smaller things, uh, the detail-oriented things, right? And another flag to identify your wingman is people help you move the table. Who's someone you can call on when you're organizing an event and you're like, hey, Brad, can you come help me move the table? Do they show up to do that? I think that's a good indicator of someone who's invested in you personally and you connect with on a very deep and meaningful level. Um, or they're just really good at moving tables. It could be either one. But you get the idea that I'm trying to say here. <clears throat> Respect your wingman, right? Hold each other mutually accountable. I think that's a good part about these. We have these kind of friends out there within the workplace. The thing you wanna enter into them is say, hey, how about we become our accountability buddies to each other? How do we get you guys, how do, we, how do I get you and me to be more productive and to be more um, encouraging uh, with, within each other's relationship? And another, I heard about this great story between this is that Ben Affleck and Matt Damon are actually each other's accountability buddies. When they both were starting out as actors, they both would meet up for lunch every day and they talk about, okay, how many auditions did you go for? What was the feedback you got? What was the um, cr criticism you got? What are things you could do better? And I love that idea. That's the basic idea when you think about your wingman. Someone will hold you accountable for your career goals as you hold them accountable for your, theirs. They'll get into the nitty gritty with you, right? These are people who will sit and listen to your problems, they'll listen to your frustrations, um, even the small minutia, they're willing to sit with you. And of course, another way to think about it is text them when you're nervous before a meeting. 
We want to build that relationship. And part of that is by opening up and being vulnerable and connecting with them and including them in your day-to-day -day as they are in yours. Okay. All right. Um, again, with these people, you should be reaching out to them once every two weeks, right? Because you want to keep them uh, much more apprised of what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis uh, than your other people in your community. <clears throat> so think about who are potential wingmen and wingwomen that you have connection with, that you could potentially build. For potential wingmen and women, you have connections with. Take a couple of seconds and think about that. Okay. And again, we'll skip this and come back to the end of this section and go through this. <clears throat> Last one is find your fans, right? This is again an easy indicator of people who want, who are your fans. They just love you and love all about all you do. These are the people who just smile every time you come by them. They're happy when you're around, right? They show up at your events. They're always there. If you're throwing like a ERG event, they're there. If they're if you're trying to lead an online workshop, they'll they'll be the first one to like that post, right? Um, that's a sign of a good fan. Um, they just want to support you, and they're also. The way to think about that with your fans is you have to be genuinely interested in them as human beings, right? You're not a celebrity out there just constantly signing photographs. These are people who are fans of what you do and what you stand for. Uh, but at the same time, it has to be some level of reciprocity as well. So be genuinely interested in them when you do see them and cultivate those relationships as well accordingly. Um, another good way to think about how to cultivate that is involve them often. If you're going out for a lunch, group lunch, feel free to invite them. If you're if a bunch of you guys are leaving for team drinks, invite them. That's an easy way to find uh, and rotate uh, fans of yours within the company, both internally and externally. And if possible, try to catch up with them once a quarter, right? Like do a coffee, grab lunch with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, these are the people who will speak your praises um, throughout the company. And they're most likely people all over the company, not just in your department, but all, all over. <clears throat> okay, so think about potential fans you can recruit. Who are potential fans you can recruit and bring into your fold? Take a couple of seconds and think about that. Okay, cool. And let's actually get into this part real quick. I want to hear about people, uh, whether it's your fans, your rabbi, or your wingman. I want to hear from you guys. Do you have any ideas um, for who you think you could bring into fold? Um, and or if not, what are some pushbacks? Like, what are some challenges you're having in connecting with these people? Um, or what are you afraid of? I kind of want to hear from you guys. What do you What do you think about this? Do you think I'm this is a good idea, or do you think this is something? That requires more investigation. I'll go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a great idea. I mean, I think I think that this it it requires you to be a fan as well. I think um, I don't I don't do social media as much as I should sometimes. I think that's the challenge I feel. Um, but I love that idea of a wingman. And I as thinking about it, I realize well, wing women in my case, but I have a couple that I yeah feel like they just I just don't call them that, and I think maybe I should. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that, Kate. I think that's exactly what it is. When I found my accountability buddy, it, honestly, we were just friends. But then we said, hey, we're both trying to build our businesses. Let's just be everything to each other and from a professional context, right? And I just changed everything. Now we check in and it's become kind of part of my work system. So just like I have other things I have to do as part of my, my team, I will do this as well. So that's the way to think about it as you're going through it. Awesome. Um, all right, I'm gonna move ahead and jump on because there are a couple more concepts I wanna share before we leave. All right, so, um, okay. So next part is, again, the key I want you to remember with all this is surrounding yourself with people who see your value and remind you of it. Make sure that sticks, sticks with you, okay? Invest in your evangelist, right? Again, consistent reach outs is two thirds of success. It's like you hear showing up is 80% uh, of success, reaching out consistently is two-thirds of success, right? Be genuinely curious and empathetic with the people who are uh, following you and are big fans of who you are and want to help you. 
Uh, and a quick tip I will give you around how to connect with people, anybody you talk to, is focus on their health, wealth, and children. This is an easy way to connect with any person, especially if you're at a random networking event. Um, focus on health, wealth, or children. That's the three things most people care about. Every, almost everyone cares about one of these things. Like, so if you ask, how are things going with you? How are your kids? How are things going with your business? How are things going? Are you doing okay? Those are the kind of things that will get you directly into some sort of intimate conversation with somebody else. All right, so something to think about. <clears throat> and then share progress and ask for feedback. This is a key part of this. I, the last thing I want to say about this, which I think is very important, is that people, just like investors don't invest in dots when it comes to entrepreneurs, they invest in lines. It's the same with people as well, right? Um, you want to be enthusiastic and vulnerable with your community because they, again, comes back to the authenticity, but also the key to everything is that you want them to be emotionally invested in you and your journey. That's the key. The moment your community is emotionally invested in you and your journey, they're bought in to whatever you're doing. And whether your things fail, especially when your things fail, they're okay. They're the support system. They're like, don't worry about it. Get back up again and try it. And so think about that when you are sharing progress and asking for feedback with your community, all right? Okay, cool. Let's get to something more specific, relevant to where we are. Building goodwill in a community in crisis. And I gotta call my man, Benji Frank, as they call him, I don't know why, I made that up right now. Benjamin Franklin is, I think, a great uh, example of how to build goodwill in a community in crisis. And I wanna quickly go through that, all right? During the war, when uh, the British were about to invade America, and uh, they, they were like, okay, we got to send out some letters and to the dignitaries and say, hey, we've come. You guys need to stop all the revolution nonsense. They didn't know who to reach out to. And they literally didn't know who to give a letter to and say, hey, stop being a rebel. And so the only person they could think of was Benjamin Franklin. And there's a reason for that. He was the center of information in a time when mail had just become a popular global phenomenon. Benjamin Franklin was constantly writing emails. And to me, he speaks to this idea of being the aggregator and disseminator of information. Right now, a lot of companies are going through a tough time. And the way to think about this is that you could help the uh, value to your company by being uh, an aggregator and disseminator of information, right? And I don't mean being a gossip, but what I mean is this is an idea to help you to volunteer your help to your team, to your boss, uh, to collect updates and feedback to share with everyone. Um, there's something about somebody who's able to collect all the feedback and updates that really in a transparent, organized way that makes people feel more calm and helps your boss do their job better. Um, so that's an idea to think about, being the center of information when there's a time of crisis. That's a good way to build goodwill in your community. Second, keep calm and make introductions. A lot of us, uh, Benjamin Franklin had to make an introduction, the biggest of all introductions. He had to introduce the French monarchy to the American rebels and say, hey, can we become friends and can you guys support our revolution? Um, there's a whole story behind how he did that and how he managed to do it. He, but he was so good at making introductions, he was loved by everyone in the French court. And that's the key to how his, to how the American revolution actually succeeded. So. Right now, a lot of us are isolated. We're behind laptops and we're just trying to, you know, make do. This would be a good time to help people break out of shells and connect with each other, right? Making introductions is a good way of saying, hey, I'm thinking about you. I thought this would be someone of interest to who you are, right? And the most valuable people in any company or organization or every community are the people who cross multiple social circles. So if you are in a designer community, try to jump out and talk to somebody in the engineering community. If you're in the marketing community, try to talk to somebody in the sales community, right? Like it's about being able to traverse multiple circles that makes you of value. And that's another way to keep building goodwill in your community as a whole. Um, you can do this with a very simple exercise. Few minutes each day can lead to dramatic impact. All you gotta do is think of one person you wanna connect today and be like, hey, I thought about you, I saw this article, I think maybe you'll enjoy this article. Oh, you should meet my friend. I met her at a workshop the other time online and she's working on this and this. I think you two should connect. Let me connect you. Um, think about this and make it a practice. Uh, this definitely helps, especially when we're all isolated. Okay, last one, organize social hangouts. A bunch of us are doing this. I've seen it. I would ask you to take the or lead on this. Benjamin Franklin, again, he's actually possibly the founder of modern day networking. He started a club called the Junto Club and he literally brought together people and they were 
very intentional and purposeful. They built the first public library, free public library. They built a hospital, the University of Pennsylvania Hospital. Like it's amazing, and that's the same thing with what I would say uh, for you as well. Some of us get so kind of tunnel vision when we're working. It's hard to take our heads up and think about something else, but get comfortable bringing people together, especially if you're a little more introverted, you can do it using your comfort zone. Like you can send emails. And again, these are people you're organizing around a special cause. These are not just generic people. Maybe these are people who are interested in the latest software, up, um, your software language updates, right? Like you can organize people around a cause. Um, this is another great way to get people to have fun uh, because they're interested in the same topic or the same cause. And then at the same time, also get better at organizing people. Um, the cool thing about this trick, um, it's not a trick, it's, it's a strategy, is that by constantly, social organize, by constantly organizing social events, you're basically making people familiar with your face on a broader basis. And it, it's synonymous, when people see you organizing, it's synonymous with leadership. It's just one of those things our brain gets tricked into doing. We're like, oh, okay. Um, you know, Mackenzie's constantly organizing stuff. Like I'm invariably going to keep thinking of her in a leadership perspective. And that's something else you can think about when you're organizing social hangouts, you're slowly building this idea and image of yourself as someone who organizes and leads. Okay. All right. So think about what are three things you can do to add value to your work community. Um, again, I'm going to kind of brush past this real quick, but I would really urge you to go back and think about this. What are three things you can do to add value to your work community, especially during when this moment when we're remote and we're kind of companies are struggling to figure out how to make it, right? Uh, be creative and be uh, curious about that, okay? All right, so I'm gonna skip past this because we're almost out of time. So I wanna jump into the next part, the last part. Um, again, people promote the people they know, trust, and who they see stretching beyond their immediate duties, interacting with other teams and their leadership. And by doing this, it gives you a household name and creates opportunities for you to become a more well-rounded contributor to your business. Um, and I love this quote by Morgan, uh, who's the head of marketing at blueboard.com. So I thought I'd post it because it articulates what we're talking about. Okay, the last part I want to talk about is the entrepreneur's guide to the top. Um, this is very, very uh, important because if you've done the first three parts, right, this is where it comes through, right? Harvard study, um, Harvard Business School did a study where they did a 10 year study of 17,000 C suite executives on how they became CEOs. And what they found uh, can be summarized in this CEO sprinters. And again, you can use the analogy for not just being a CEO, but just being a leader in your own community, whatever, whatever that looks like. Um, they don't accelerate to the top by acquiring the perfect pedigree by going to the right school. They do it by making bold career moves over the course of their career that catapult them to the top. And let me explain that more. All right. So the basic gist of that comes down to start something new. If you really want to make an impact on your company, think of something new that's of value to them. And I'll get into that a little bit more. But what you want to think about is organizing a special project to have a bottom line impact on the company. And these kind of special projects that you're doing should touch numerous aspects of the business. Okay. Um, it has to be cross-functional for you to really show that you can be a leader and have an impact on the bottom line. Uh, so there are different ways to think about that. You could be starting a new product line. You could be looking at a cost saving uh, process for the whole company. Um, but the idea is that you got to think outside the box and start something new, something that affects the bottom line and touches different parts of the company's business. Okay. So when you think about the company, your company you work for or any company you work for, you have to know their basic goals and needs, right? So if you want to break down a company, it really is, you can break it down to a very simple thing. It's revenue and cost. You're trying to increase your revenue and you're trying to lower your cost. These are the bottom line impacts I'm talking about when I say the impact you can make. Um, the first one, you can do impact through increasing sales. You can do it through R&D. You can do it through brand awareness. And if you want to lower costs, you can do it through operational efficiency, through vendors and employee engagement. So these are different areas where you could look into that speaks to you and hiring kind of miss, crosses both. Uh, when you think about ideas for the helping your company, these are different areas you could go help your company to make a bottom line impact, okay? And during a crisis, leadership is especially busy. There's plenty of opportunities to add value in these sections I told you about, but most people are just trying to fix the holes in their sinking ship, right? Inherit and embrace the mess. 
this to me is the best part of what we're going through. If there's a best part to this crisis, it is that if you can jump on this and be part of the mess and say, okay, I want to help this ship in some way if possible, people will love that. Not only will they love that you jumped in when they're dealing with a lot, but then if you create something that's of immense value to them, they will really respect that and come to appreciate who you are. So organize a project, create a compelling performance challenge. Okay, we're going to launch a new um, digital um, brand that we think will definitely reflect the company, right? Get your leadership's approval and put together a diverse and smart team. Uh, and this last part is where I want to come back to. And I know I've kind of gone through it really fast. Take your time and go back and look at it. But the project success based on what we've talked about, right? if you've done the past three things really well, if you know your brand, you so have a supportive network, and you have a goodwill and community, you have the highest probability of success in doing this project. And that's the point. The ideas that you can do will be built not just by yourself, but by the community you've built as well to help spread your brand. So I know we're out of time. In summary, I just want to say, know your brand, invest in your evangelist support network, build goodwill in your community, um, lead a project with bottom line impact, and then as always, double down on all of this during a crisis, right? I think that's the point I want to take away from all of this is that there's so much you guys can do right now with what you're going on. You don't have to feel like you're banished and relegated behind the screen. There's stuff you can add of value. Um, I know I covered a lot. Does anybody have any questions or comments or thoughts? Okay. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Um, you know, feel free to be honest if you didn't. <laughs> you can tell. Uh, I think we might be sending out a feedback survey. So, um, but again, I can make this, I'll give this uh, presentation to Mackenzie and she can make it available to all of you. Um, and of course the recording is there, so you can go back and look at it. But if you have any further questions, please feel free to call, uh, reach out to me. And my name is Nikhil Paul. Like I said, I'm the founder of We Are Human. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much again. And thank you, Mass TLC and Mackenzie for helping make this a reality. Thanks guys. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, like Mikhail said, I'll be sending out a recording of the webinar with the slides and survey and just some follow up to um, keep everyone engaged. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your Friday. Have a nice weekend. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Bye bye. Bye.